AOSD challenge. AOSD. Watch me bring it out. Assembly sound doctrine. AOSD. Watch me bring it out. You know this, you know this, so what they say. I wasn't going to actually do this lesson right here on uh, Clubhouse, per se. I was only going to do it on uh, my Facebook and YouTube. But I decided to go ahead and do this lesson on Clubhouse also. Because uh, I think it is... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on y'all. Give me one second. Say it again. Oh uh, yeah, fam. Uh, I got two different programs running. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and I actually wasn't gonna do this part of the lesson uh, on my on my clubhouse, but I think it's actually needed to know. And I got it on the replay mode, so anyone can come in later on and listen to the replay about the importance of love uh, dealing with the Bible. Uh, did you want to add anything, Bobby, before I, before I go in? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and today is not going to be one of the normal, uh, 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 you know, lesson days. Today is going to be, it might get a little weird to some people because of the information that I'm going to bring out. But I'm going to bring out the importance of love because when we ask people what love is today, uh, they tell you love is keeping the law. And uh, they kind of end it with that. And we really don't understand what that, like, what is, what is that? How is that? going to help us out or how does that prove love and this stuff because that's the narrative that we have uh, in the western world because we don't understand the importance of love but if anyone don't know me personally um i actually study uh near-death experiences uh in order and i use that in order to understand more of the bible that's how some of my theology is different from uh, people's other people's theologies and if anyone don't know what a near-death experience is it's the people they die right they they go over into the next realm uh, and they stay over there they are able to say uh, what happened they remember what happened then they come back over into this realm and they actually are able to expound on what they experienced for those five or six or hours or two or three hours that they was dead and they bring that information over and then you know they expound uh, upon it and what a lot of people don't know um the information that they bring back sometimes it doesn't deal uh correctly with western theology sometimes it don't even deal correctly with with eastern theology but it sometimes it don't even deal correctly with people get from the bible and the reason is because the bible has a different meaning uh than most people think in context uh, once you actually go to some of the biblical uh, people that left these commentaries and etc., they explain that these things are 
having a, a deeper meaning the way that you know than what most people are believing so once you take it from that narrative it makes more sense but once you take it from the narrative of trying to uh, uh, prove the the history part of it and all of that stuff uh, it gets a little off and this is when people cross over to the next realm they're not seeing all of these things that the pastors and all of these people told them that they were supposed to see when they go over there so what we're going to do tonight we're going to actually go and I'm not going to say if these people are lying or telling the truth. I don't know. But I know that I got the information that they wrote and left over. And with this information that they wrote and left over, I'm going to bring it out tonight and say exactly what these guys stated, what happened. And we're going to find out the importance of love. L-O-V-E. And we're going to see if this dealing with the law of Moses, keeping the law of Moses, or if it's something different going on. So, right now, I got this book right here. It's called Imagine Heaven I'm see, Devotional, right here, by John Burke, right? And if you have been, you know, used to my channel, you know I, I read from this book every once in a while. But he have taken over like a hundred um, interviews about people that had near-death experiences and he wrote it all in one book um their small section segments and he's explaining what these people said that they saw when they crossed over right so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna read from a couple of things that he stated then i'm gonna read from a couple of things that uh that uh swingberg stated and then i'm gonna read um from the bible and i'm gonna see if the things uh go together right so we got imagine heaven uh this is about people who have died and went over and i think these discussions need to be held i think we need to have these discussions uh believing in the bible believing in the afterlife believing in um a resting place for our souls i believe these questions these this topic needs to be discussed this getting overlooked so I'm going to read uh, page 35. This is Ian. I-A-N. This is what happened to him. It says, as he was praying, Ian breathed his last breath. At first, he found himself in a very dark place. So this is what it says. Then a brilliant light shone upon me and literally drew me out of the darkness. We literally have this being explained in the Bible. It looked unspeakably bright, as if it was the center of the universe, the source of all light and power. It was more brilliant than the sun, more radiant than any diamond, brighter than a laser beam, yet you could look right into it. I found myself beginning to weep uncontrollably as the love became stronger and stronger so now what i would do first he says he's crying uncontrollably as the love was becoming stronger and stronger so now he's in spirit form he's in soul form and even though he's in soul form he still can cry so with me looking at this near-death experience right and i go to the book of revelation and it says there's going to be no more crying in the kingdom and he's going to a place where the kingdom is is in the next realm and he's crying then therefore literal tears cannot be the true meaning behind it because we have a soul crying as he goes into the next realm so that right there shows me that your theology is off when you're looking for literal tears to stop but i'm, I'm gonna keep going it says i found myself beginning to weep uncontrollably as the love became stronger and stronger it was so clean and pure, no strings attached. As I stepped into the light, it was if I'd come inside veils of suspended shimmering lights, like suspended stars or diamonds, giving off the most amazing radiance. And as I walked through the light, it continued to heal the deepest part of me. So this light was a healing light. Get it? No more pain. No more sorrow. 
this he was being healed within, but he was able to still weep. Maybe these things have deeper meanings in different levels. But let's keep going. As I walk through the light, I, it continued to heal the deepest part of me. As I lifted my eyes up, I could see the chest of a man with his arms outstretched as if it was to welcome me. So that's his experience right now. It don't go on. And if it do, I'm not going to read what else happened. But notice what wasn't stated here. Nothing about the law of Moses. Nothing about the law of Moses at all. It, it didn't say that there was a being there, stopped them and said, hey, uh, I saw that you didn't have fringes on while you was on planet Earth. So since you don't have fringes on, I'm going to damn you somewhere else. It said it was an arm outstretched welcoming him. Notice he didn't say nothing about, it asked him about did he eat pork. Uh, he didn't say nothing about pork dust. It didn't say nothing about shrimp. Lobster, it didn't ask him how many feast days he had, how many feast days he didn't have. Notice all of that was left out, but he still felt love. It's something magnificent, brilliant, was welcomed him in to his space. See, that's one, right? So now I want to go to, and notice it was love. He felt love. It was pure and righteous love that he felt. So now I want to go to page 42. I'm going to read uh, 42 and 43. It says, Marcy was a Christian. Now notice, Christians. You know how people have a bad image of Christians, right? Especially in our community, a lot of people want to dog Christianity out. Oh, y'all lawless people, you don't keep no laws and all that stuff. Marcy was a Christian who had wandered far from the Lord in despair due to ongoing marital struggles. During her NDE, which is near-death experience, she experienced the most extravagant comfort from God himself. This is her experience. I was pulled through a tunnel with the light getting brighter and brighter. After a while, I was suddenly standing in front of this beautiful wrought iron Victorian gate covered with the largest and most brilliant colored flowers I had ever seen. Once you notice this, this is the same layout that was on the tabernacles as well as the temple, which is a layout of the Garden of Eden. This is why on the tabernacle in the temple, they put uh, the, in, they inbred it uh, embroidered flowers all throughout the uh, the wall to represent the Garden of Eden. So now we have a woman who crossed over. She's at a gate, and these gates has flowers all over it, all throughout it, right? Once again, showing how the Bible can connect to actually what's going on in the spiritual realm. So let's keep going. Just before I entered, a voice in my mind spoke to me. I turned to look to my left, and there stood Jesus Christ. Uh, I could see his nail prints in his hands and feet, but they were not in his hands. They were more in his wrist area and angled out as though they were torn from his weight. I thought people said Christ didn't exist. I thought Torah only said they made it up. It was made up, right? There's no Jesus Christ in there. Oh, y'all making all this up. You New Testament people are frauds. This is uh, uh, the, the Romans created. But we have people who crossed over who have a different experience. So should we believe them or you? But let's keep going. It says, but there was no verbal speaking, just mental telepathy. I ran to him and wrapped my arms around his feet kissing his feet and telling him how much I loved him. Was she telling him how much she kept the commandments? How much she did the feast days? All that stuff? No. How much I loved him. His arms came down and he held my head close to him as I cried hard. I could tell that I was standing at the base of a huge stairway. I called it a huge throne with the most brilliant light shining down from it. It was God. 
Jesus was standing on the right hand of God at the base of his throne. I began talking to God, telling him how much I loved him and Jesus. At that point, I could tell that Jesus was communicating with God, telling God how much I loved him and believed that he died for my sins. God then spoke mentally to me and told me how much he loved me. Jesus was the mediator between God and me. You see how this is adding up with the Bible? You see how this love right here that God has for his creation, how his creation has love for him? Notice, nobody has brought up a law of Moses. Why is that? But meanwhile, you guys are bringing it up. So we're talking about real people who then died and crossed over, and they're going through something different than what you're teaching. But let's continue. Let's keep going. Uh, it says, a God spoke mentally to me and told me to go back. Your time has not yet come. I pleaded with him and fell to my knees, begging him not to send me back. No thought of the world was inside me. It was all heavenly minded. Now you see how Paul was telling the people in the first century. Don't be earthly minded. Be heavenly minded. And you know how people talk today, oh well you got the you got all these people in this world. They want you to have your your heaven when you leave this world. Why you can't have your heaven on earth? See, this is why I don't deal with the Bible because blah, 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 this and that, all of that ridiculous stuff. Meanwhile, these people ain't crossed over and saw nothing. They're telling you how they personally feel off of their warped mind because of the way that they was brought up. This girl, this woman, she didn't want to come back. She said she didn't think nothing about no world. She wasn't worried about no boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, kids. She wasn't worried about... Um, Bills. She wasn't worried about rent. She wasn't worried about who liked her and who did not like her. She set her things upon heavenly. The same thing Paul said. Set your mind upon heavenly things. Look at the things that's above. Jerusalem from above. Think about the treasures that you have stored in heaven. Same thing Christ told that guy. You'll have treasures in heaven. And that guy was like, I don't want that. I want treasures on earth. I'm not dealing with it. What are you talking about treasures in heaven? Meanwhile, you see how the mindset of the people change when they're crossed over and they're looking at the king in his face. All that hype stuff gone now. Looking at the king directly in his face. Now we're, they're, she's pleading. Remember she said she left Christianity, but now she's pleading to stay because now she realized what was in store for her. The, the things that happened while she was on earth did not compare to the things that was going to go on when she went to the next realm because she didn't stop existing. She continued on existing, but when she crossed over, that world over there was better than the world over here. So she was worried about the world over there now, not the world here. And we're supposed to be worried about the world there, not the world here. That's why the Bible tells us, don't love this world or the lust of the world. Keep your mind on heavenly things. Keep your mind on the things that please the Father so you can partake in the inheritance that's given to you that's in eternity. Not a 30-year, 40-year while we're on planet Earth, or 50-year, 60-year. We're talking about eternity once you shed this tabernacle and it's time to be right there in front of the king and you explain to the king why you did or did not do the things that he said. Then you can explain to him about how you was telling people about fringes and Sabbath days. You can explain that to him then. But right now, this Christian lady, she didn't have to go through none of that. So let, let's keep going. It stated, I was crying and begging so loudly. She wanted to stay. Y'all get that? Look how much she wanted to stay. She wasn't worried about no earthly stuff. I was crying and begging so loudly. Then I suddenly felt God's arms come down. There were no arms, but I felt them. And he lifted me up off my feet and cradled me as a mother as a mother cradles her baby against her breast. He rocked me and held me in his arms. He gently placed me uh, back to my feet. My bad. Uh, Bob, if you're still in here, I'm going uh, 
I don't know how long you're going to stay in here, but I'm going to make you a moderator right now. If you want to bring anybody up, just uh, let them know they got to uh, be uh, quiet until I'm done. And if you don't want to bring nobody up, you don't got to. I'm just going to uh, just, just talk. But we have it right here. It says, I was crying and begging so loudly that I suddenly felt God's arm come down. There was no arms, but I felt them. And he lifted me off my feet and cradled me as a, mother, as a mother cradles her baby against her breast. He rocked me and held me in his arms. He gently placed me back to my feet and then told me that I had to go back because I have children that were going to be born to me. And I needed to go back to receive his gift of children. The doctors told me I could not have had I could not have children before I died. The second that God told me he was giving me children, I immediately became earthly minded and began my trip back through this vast area. See how suddenly things changed with a moment in the twinkling of an eye, as the Bible stated, until I was again hovering over my body in bed. I felt my feet enter through my fleshly head and lower itself into my lifeless body. When I opened my eyes, my husband was on his knees praying to God not to take me from him. So notice, her husband's on earth praying that, that his wife comes back to him Meanwhile, she's in the next realm praying that the Lord don't send her back. This is how marvelous the next realm is. And notice all of the love that she felt, right? It didn't have nothing to do with the law of Moses. So now, let's go to page 60 and 61. It says, it was, and I'm going to read uh, a few more of these, then I'm going to go to Swedenborg, and then I'm going to go straight to the Bible, and then we can end it. It says, it was 1943 in Camp Barkley, Texas, and George Ritchie had enlisted to fight the Nazis. In the middle of boot camp, he woke up at midnight, heart pounding, with 106 degree fever. During x-rays, he passed out, and the, the attending doctor declared him dead. Once again, y'all, these are near-death experiences what people go through when they cross over and then they came and they told people what happened. And does this goes with does this go with your theology? How you teach the Bible? Is this the the the, the things that they're bringing back? Is it going and aligning with your doctrine? If it's not, maybe you need to change your doctrine because it don't seem like they're worrying about no law of Moses here. It don't seem like it. It seemed like they was worried about love believing on Christ, believing on the Father, and etc., being a Christian. But anyway, let's go. The attending doctor declared him dead. Years later, as a medical doctor, George would display his death certificate whenever he spoke about his life-changing encounter. So it says he's showing people he died. He, he got his death certificate showing people. Where was I, George pondered. I stared in astonishment as the brightness increased coming from nowhere, seeming to shine everywhere at once. Notice it's always brightness. The Bible always talk about this brightness. We find out that this brightness in earthly form represents wisdom, but in heavenly form, it represents something else. So the allegorical for wisdom on earth has a deeper meaning in the heavenly world. But anyway, it was impossibly bright. It was like a million welders lamps all blazing at once and the right in the middle of my amazement came a prosaic thought probably born of some biology lecture back at the university i'm glad i don't have physical eyes at this moment i thought this light would destroy the retina in the tenth of a second no i corrected myself not the light he he will be too bright to look at for now I saw that it was not light, but a man who had entered the room, or rather, a man made of light. So when they saw Christ, and when Christ went on the mountain, and when Christ 
uh, transfigured, what did it say Christ looked like? It said he glowed like the sun. When Moses went into the uh, heavenly realm and Moses came back down, what did it say Moses' face, uh, face looked like? It said his face looked like the sun. It shone like the sun. It scared the people so bad that he had to put a veil over his face. So this is what happened in the heavenly realm. They're made of light. They shine. So when they're talking about uh, the, those that be wise is going to shine like the stars in the sky, like the firmament, then we understand this is how they look in the heavenly realm. They're talking about heavenly spiritual stuff. But let's keep going. And this is how you perceive what the Bible is talking about because you, you don't have the spiritual element behind it, so you kind of make it up. But there's spiritual elements here that people wrote that we can understand what this stuff actually means. So now let's keep going. It says, the instant I perceived him, a command formed itself in my mind. Stand up. I got to my feet, and as I did, came the stu stupendous certainty. You are in the presence of the Son of God. From his presence came a love beyond my wildest imagining. This love knew every unlovable thing about me every mean selfish thought and action since the day i was born and accepted and loved me just the same come on guys i mean what, what are we getting here y'all y'all see the love here how important the love is is in the heavenly realm in the spiritual world but now let's keep going he was not blaming or reproaching he was simply loving me. He wasn't fringes checking or none of that. He was simply loving me, filling the world with himself, and yet somehow attended to me personally, waiting for my answer to the question that still hung in the dazzling air. What have you done with your life to show me? That was the question that the Messiah had this soul that crossed over. What have you done with your life to show me? Now imagine he said, well, I didn't eat pork. Imagine he said, I, I wore fringes. Uh, I, I did the Sabbath days. Uh, I did the Feast of Time. All of that self-righteous stuff. Imagine he would have said all of that. Meanwhile, Christ told you what you had to do to get to his kingdom. Uh, feed the hungry. Clothe the, those that are naked. Visit the sick. Visit those that are in prison, and etc. He told you the things that he needed you to do to be good kingdom citizens. And here you go with all the self-righteous stuff. Nothing that he told you not to do. You're talking about Christians. He ain't said nothing about no law of Moses. I don't, out of a hundred of these uh, uh, stories, ain't now one of them brought up the law of Moses. Why is that? Well, let's keep going. It says, the question, like everything else proceeding from him, had to do with love let me write let me read that again the question like everything else proceeding from him had to do with love how much have you loved with your life not how much you love your life but how much have you loved which your with your life whatever i saw was only from the doorway, so to speak, but it was enough to convince me totally that how we spend our time on earth, the kind of relationships we build is vastly, infinitely more important than we can know. The relationships that you build on earth the love that you show each other is more important in heaven than you know. Let's keep let's keep going. Let's keep going because let's, let's keep going. Let's, we're gonna read uh, eighty and eighty one. Then we'll be done with this book. Then I'm gonna go into my Swedenberg book, and then we're gonna go to the Bible. So let's read eighty and eighty one. It says, "Some people find it hard." to imagine laughter in heaven or the, that God has a sense of humor. But think about it. God is the creator of laughter. 
the author of all joy, the one who delights in us and cares about every detail of our lives. Leonard discovered this during his near-death experience. On the other side, communication is done via telepathy. So a lot of people is saying that they 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 speak through their mind. They speak telepathically. Uh, this is why when the when he said the new covenant came in, I'm going to give you a new mind. He kept telling them, I need you guys to change your mind. A lot of this communication is happening through the mind. He said, I'm going to give you a new spirit. So I'm going to give you, when you get that new spirit, I'm going to give you dreams and visions, which happens in your head. All of these things is through the mind. I must tell you that God has a fantastic sense of humor. I never laughed so much in all my life. We last, We laughed about the way I had seriously reacted to an event. Life on earth is a big drama. It should not be taken too much in earnest. Now, I'm going I'm to read this next uh, section, and then I'll be done. George Ritchie discovered that even his silliest thoughts could be not hidden in, in Jesus' presence. After he thought about the insurance policy, he had taken out guaranteeing him money when he turned 70, he realized that Lord had a sense of humor. The brightness seemed to vibrate and shimmer with a kind of holy laughter. Not at me and my silliness, not a mocking laughter, but a mirth that seemed to say that in spite of all error and tragedy, joy was more lasting still. 19-year-old Terry, who had a near-death experience while giving birth, said, I was enveloped in a beautiful light of love. We got it right there again. We got that love introduced again. I was enveloped in a beautiful light of love, and I knew I was being held on the lap of Jesus like a child. It was a feeling of unconditional love. Jesus and I had an astounding conversation where he patiently answered all my questions. Once I distinctly remember, well, sorry, one I distinctly remember. I had recently completed a grueling course in calculus and had gotten all the final exam answers correct except one. I wanted to know the answer to that question. Jesus laughed, then gave, Jesus laughed and then gave me the answer, not in words, but in a knowing that encompassed not just the element of the question, but a complete understanding of all relational aspects of the question. He was he has a wonderful sense of humor, and I distinctly got the feeling that he enjoys us humans as a father enjoys watching the minor scrapes children get themselves into. And it says, Jesus' genuine smile and delight impacted Julie. He gave me the smile that only Jesus can give, and I knew the answer without him having to say anything. We walked and talked for a while. He knew and answered my thoughts and I didn't need to open my mouth. That's more telepathy. I asked Jesus, what do you do here in heaven? He looked at me with this humorous smile that is beyond explanation in human words. So now, that is all, this was well, not all of them, it's just a few of the near-death experiences that I wanted to read that people go through when they crossed over, and the element that they kept saying that they felt was love, L-O-V-E, love. Is the love that they felt, is it defined as you are defining it as Bible believers, or is it defined as the emotional uh, attachments that we get when we have a deep affection for a person? I would say the emotional attachments we have when we have deep affection for a person. I would say it not, it's not about what you're doing to this law or that law to please the Father. It's about your actions toward mankind. It's about your love and your actions toward your belief on the Father and et cetera and what you're doing uh, toward that positive relationship uh, with, your, with the Father as well as with the Son, Christ, uh, through the Spirit and et cetera. So, now I want to read from Swedenberg. Now, let's see here. If anyone don't know who Swedenberg is, Swedenberg was a, um, I think, 17th century. Let me, let me, let me tell you about this, this book first, and then we're going to uh, see what he is. 
Swedenberg describes the process of dying as he experienced it personally. He goes on to discuss what happens to a newly arrived soul in the afterlife. So Swedenberg is a, let me see here. He was a Christian mystic, a scientist, a philosopher, a theologian. Uh, he tried to interpret scriptures and etc. It was said that he had kind of like a spiritual experience uh, crossing over from one side of the uh, this realm to the other side of the realm for like 20 something years I think it was like 20 some years uh, every night he was able to cross over from this uh, side of the world to I mean this side of the realm to the other side of the realm and people like oh man that, that sounds spooky what are you talking about that sounds impossible well believe it or not a lot of people use his works uh, even to the day a lot of scholars and etc the things that he said happens, a lot of people stated happens in the near-death experiences that they go through, uh, you know, in real time. Uh, and they actually made, uh, they got a movie on Netflix uh, that quoted a lot from his book also, uh, even in 2021. So uh, a lot of people take this man seriously. Now, it's on you if you take him seriously or not, but a lot of people take him seriously. He lived from January 29th, 1688 to March 29th. Uh, 1772. All right, so now uh, that was all about him. Now we're going to read uh, an excerpt from his book about what he said what happened when he crossed over. All right, let's see if we can get to it. Uh, how did I? I didn't close out of it, did I? There, give me one second to find it on my Facebook. All right, there we go, right there. I got it pulled up. Uh, this is from the Swedenbergs dealing with the last judgment and etc. And for the people who don't know, Swedenberg actually also believed that the Bible is complete. Was Swedenberg a preterist? No, he wasn't a preterist. He actually said all things in the Bible was fulfilled in year 1700, I believe, something 1700 so and so something like that he said that the final uh judgment of the bible and etc was fulfilled in that year he was not a preterist but once again uh through his uh experiences that he said he went through he was able to draw the conclusion that the bible has been fulfilled in his timeline uh we're actually saying the bible was fulfilled in christ's timeline that but Notice, he's not a full preterist. He's just a person that had spiritual experiences, uh, according to himself. And through those experiences, he was able to draw the conclusion that the Bible itself has been fulfilled. That's amazing, I think. But now, uh, this is under his section, The Last Judgment, found on page 531. We see the word charity. And if people don't know, charity is a substituted world in the a substituted word in the KJV that meant love. So now, we're going to read what he said he saw or what he knew when he went and crossed over into the uh, spiritual realm. It said that heaven is distinguished in two kingdoms. So when we talk about heaven, he says two kingdoms dealing with heaven, one of which is called the celestial kingdom and the other the spiritual love in the celestial kingdom is love to the lord and it's called celestial love and love in the spiritual kingdom is charity towards the neighbor and it's called spiritual love so he said okay we got two different loves i mean two different kingdoms when we're talking about dealing with the heavenly power you got a celestial kingdom, which is the love that we have to the Lord. Then we have a spiritual kingdom, which is the love we have towards our neighbor. So the things that we do on earth is seeming to affect what's going on in the next realm. Well, let's keep going. Heaven is distinguished into those two kingdoms. Maybe, and this may be seen in Heaven and Earth, uh, one of his books, and the divine of the Lord in the heavens is love to him and charity towards the neighbor in the same work. So to have a love toward the Lord, you got to have love to him and love for your neighbor, which is a biblical 
stands, right? And we're going to actually show this in just a second. It is known what good and truth are. Sorry, it is not known what good and truth are unless it be known what love to the Lord and charity towards the neighbor are. Because all good is of love and charity. And the truth is of good. Notice he didn't say, uh, this is only for the Israelites. And you only got to love your neighbor that's an Israelite. Only love Israelites. It don't matter whoever else it is. If it's not Israelites, you don't got to love them. Uh, no. This man said he crossed over. And it was about love for your neighbors, period. He ain't an Israelite. He was a Gentile. Straight up white man. And he's telling what he saw when he crossed over. So he, he was absent of the Israelite understanding that we see in the 21st century. And everybody else that I read in the other book was absent of the Israelite understanding that we hear in the 21st century. So now let's keep going. To know truths, to will truths, and to be affected by truths, for truth's sake, that is, because they are truths in charity. Charity consists in an in, in, in internal affection of doing truth and not in an external affection without it. Therefore, charity consists in performing uses for the sake of uses, and its kind is according to the uses. Charity is man's spiritual life. The whole word is the doctrine of love and and charity men at this day do not know what charity is still it may be known from the light of reason that love and charity constitute man also that good and truth agree together and one belongs to the other therefore charity and faith do the like i'm just going to read this a little bit more from the other from the next paragraph in the supreme sense, the Lord is the neighbor because he is to be loved above all things. Hence, all that is the neighbor which is from him and which is he is. Therefore, good and truth are the neighbor. The distinction of the neighbor is according to the quality of good. Thus, according to the presence of the Lord, every man in every society, also our country and the church and the universal sense, the kingdom of the Lord, are the neighbor and to and to do well by them from the good of love according to the several states is to love the neighbor thus the neighbor is their good uh which we ought to consult so in other words he just expounded more and more and more and more and if you actually go through his works he concentrates on love 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 toward one another he actually states that uh your position when you cross over into the next realm depends on the amount of love you showed on this realm. Uh, this is what Christ was telling them in the Bible. Your works will follow you. So he told them to love, so their works of love followed them into the next realm. This is why we see in the near-death experiences, I just can uh, uh, conclude or draw a conclusion. This is why we saw when uh, he asked the lady, or it might have been a gentleman, or uh, you can rewind this and, and listen to it, uh, what have you done in your life? He was like, I knew he was talking about how much love I didn't uh, show. So now, let's move on now. So now we done went through the near-death experiences, right? Uh, Swedenberg then talked about the kingdom and uh, the function of love in the kingdom, right? We have different uh, people who talked about what happened to their souls when they went over and what they felt and the conversations they had was dealing with love. So in the afterlife, we didn't went over the kingdom. In the afterlife, we didn't went over the souls, right? So when people ask what happens in the afterlife, uh, we didn't went over what the kingdom is about and what's going on with the souls. So now let's go over the creator himself. It's time to hit that Bible now. I know you guys have been waiting on that Bible. I was like, when this Bible going to come out? This brother's talking crazy. So when the Bible going to come out? So now let's, let's bring out the Bible, right? Let's see what the Lord says. So now let's find out about the Father first, right? Let's find out about the Father. So 1 John 4, we're going to find out about the Father. 1 John 4, 8, He that loveth not, knoweth not God, 
for God is love. So now we're talking about spiritual applications. Of We found out that the kingdom was full of love. We found out that there was a love feeling that's, uh, that, uh, that's undescribable when a soul crosses over to the next realm. We found out that, um, that the, 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 their love is judged about what they did and didn't do in the, in the world to display love. So we found out what all happened in the next realm. So now we're finding out about the creator or the ruler of rulers in the next realm, which is God. And we have the prophet saying, God himself is love. So his kingdom is love. The souls he created is love. The power that they feel is love. And now God himself is being love. So let's, let's keep going. Read verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God had to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. This had nothing about this had nothing to do with keeping the law of Moses. Nothing at all. But now we're gonna read John 3.16. Now here's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So now, once again, we read that the Father is love. And the Father has love for his creation. So now we're going to read Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So now we show that God loved his creation so much that even while they were sinners, he sent his son to die for them just so they could have a relationship with him. And then we're going to go to Zephaniah 3.17. It says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love and he will joy over thee with singing. So now we got once again the application of the love that comes from the Lord. He's resting in his love. He is love. He loves his creation. So we got love in the afterlife. We got love from the creator, the, the ultimate creator, the, the father of the universe. And then we have love in the kingdom, which he created also. So all of these things is dealing with love, 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 right? Ain't nobody brought up the law of Moses yet. So now, let's deal, that's the father right there, right? Let's deal with the son. Let's see what the son says. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. A Zephaniah 3 and 17. Oh, we went to uh, John 3, 16. Then we did Romans 5 and 8. And then Zephaniah 3, 17. Uh, yes, sir. So now, that's the Father, right? That's dealing with the Father. Now, let's see. What the son says. So we're going to go to John 13 and 1. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now, people tell you, ask people, what is love? Love is doing the law of Moses. So, in other words, you're saying Jesus, having done the law of Moses to his own, where in the world he did the law of Moses to, uh, to the end. And that's what it's saying. No, that's what you guys are adding to try to create a narrative that's not there. It said that he loved his own, which were in the world. He loved his disciples. And he loved them unto the end, to the end. So the father 
has love. The Father is love. And now we have his son displaying love. So now we can go to John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So notice Christ said, hey, do my commandments, keep them. That's how you love me. And that's how you show love to my father. And I will love you if you do that. And I will manifest myself to the person that I love, as well as telling the Father about them, right? And we find out later on that the commandment that he got, that he was talking about, definitely wasn't the law of Moses. Uh, once you go to John 14, let's see if I can find it real fast. Uh, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Let's see if I can find that, what that is real fast. Uh, let's see here. And this is my commandments. Let's see. Uh, no, no, no. It's not in this one. But uh, I can I come back to it. He said, and this is my commandment that you love me. So now we're going to go to John 15, uh, 9 through 13. It might be here. So let's see here. It might be this one. John 15, 9. As the Father hath loved me, so now we have love again, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, here we go again, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. We have it right here. Verse 12. This is what I was looking for. This is my commandment. That ye love one another as I have loved you. So he said, if, if, you, if you keep my commandments, I'm going to love you. I'm going to present you to the Father. I'm going to show myself unto you. I'm going to make sure that you're straight. So then he tells you what his commandment is. He didn't say nothing about the Ten Commandments. He didn't bring up the law of Moses. He didn't do none of that. He said, this is my commandment. Just in case you guys don't understand what I'm saying, this is my commandment. That ye love one another as I have loved you. Right? Greater, this is verse 13, greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. So you have it right there. Once again, he's expressing love, love, love. So now we're going to go to Romans 8, 35. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Question mark. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? I'm going to read some more. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So I, I'm, I'm going to keep reading. For I, am for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, 
which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I don't know. I mean, once again, that would have been the perfect opportunity to bring up the law of Moses. That would have been the perfect opportunity to bring up anything carnal. Perfect opportunity. But notice, he did not bring up anything carnal at all. Not one thing. So now, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians now. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So we got right there again, all of the action. Christ said, no greater love than he, than a man who laid down his life for his friends. And we have right here in 2 Corinthians, he's going back to that love that Christ did in his sacrifice. So now, what have we done did? We show love, the importance of love, the experience of love to people who had near-death experiences. Different people who had near-death experiences, they all explain the love that they felt when they crossed over. They wasn't talking about the law of Moses. They wasn't talking about the Ten Commandments. They wasn't even talking about some of the things that they was doing on earth. They was mainly focused on the love that they felt when they crossed over and when they went to the Messiah. So we got the souls in the afterlife talking about love. Then we got Swedenberg expounding on the spiritual things that he said he received when he was going through his spiritual experiences that the kingdom of God and the celestial kingdom both deals with the love for your neighbor and the love for the God and the Messiah. So we got love for the souls, dealing with souls. We got love dealing with the kingdom. We got, then we went over God, right? The love that God has for mankind. So we went over love dealing with God. And then we had, we went over the love that the son presented to mankind. So we didn't went over love for the son. So now we didn't went from soul to kingdom to the father to the son. So now it's time for the people. So let's go to everyday citizens, not people that's dead, but people that's still alive. Let's go to those everyday citizens now. We found out how love affected the dead. We found out how love affected the celestial. We found out how love affected the father. We found out how love affected the son. So now let's find out how love affects people that were still alive now. So we go, we're going to go to John. Uh, 13, we're going to read 34 through 35, it says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now, imagine how, what kind of society that they had to live in for him to say, hey, if you love one another, that's how people are going to tell that you belong to me. You are part of me if you have love for one another. So it shows that in that time period, a lot of people didn't have love for one another. So that would make them uh, pretty much be sanctified or holy or set apart. But notice, this was something for people alive to do living people now they have to love one another also how the son loved christ loved them how the father loved them now they got to love one another so we're gonna go to first john four and we almost done y'all first john four twenty and twenty one it says if a man say i love god and hated his brother he is a liar for he that loveth not his brother, whom he had seen, how can he love God, whom he had not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God 
love his brother also. That's what the community had to do. So we're going to go to Romans 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. So they had to be affectionate and brotherly love. This is what uh, Paul is telling the church now, right? And we can go to Romans. Uh, now, this is when we're going to bring in uh, things about the law because a lot of people want to bring in the law. We can't, we can't exclude the law. So now, Let's even see the point of the law. Once we see the point of the law, it actually goes on what we're, what we're saying. So you go to Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another. There we go again. For he that loveth another had fulfilled the law. Verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, and I want everybody to understand, this includes the Sabbath day. Once again, this includes the Sabbath day. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in, saying, in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So if a person comes with the Sabbath day talk, it's still comprehended in thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So even from the beginning when they got the law that came off of Mount Sinai, the point of that was love also. So love for your neighbor was the point of that. So even within or without that law, the point still was love. So now I want to go back to Leviticus. Go to Leviticus 19, verse 18. It says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, I am the Lord thy God. So we can see that this was actually uh, uh, one of the commandments given to uh, the Levites. And the Levites actually brought it to Israel also, right? So then let's go to Luke. Luke 6. And we're almost done. 35. Luke 6, 35 says, But love ye your enemies. And do good and lend, hope hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. So notice they have not only do you love your neighbors, you love your enemies also. That was the explanation given. So this encompasses everyone. He wanted love throughout the whole entire planet. The whole shebang bang was about love. From the spiritual realm to the corner realm, it was about love. And he made sure he didn't leave no stone unturned. I want you to love your neighbors. I want you to love your family. I even want you to love your enemies. The son is love. The father is love. The kingdom is love. The afterlife people get love. The whole point was the love that he had, that he wanted the whole world to experience so they could be kingdom-minded because the ruler of the kingdom is full of love. So the citizens of the kingdom had to be full of love. So when they brought heaven on earth, if heaven is full of love, then by default, bringing heaven on earth means the earth needed to be full of love also. So now we're going to read Matthew 22. Uh, and I got one, two more uh, books, and I'm done. Uh, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. It says, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Sorry, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? So we're back to the law again, right? 
Jesus said unto them, unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So once again, he's leaving no stone unturned. So not only did he tell them the law that you guys received was about love, he's also saying the prophets that you guys are reading also is about love. So once again, he didn't leave no stone unturned dealing with love. The kingdom is love. The law that you guys love so much is about love. The prophets that you guys keep running to is about love. Um, I'm about love. My father is about love. The souls that's going to die and go into the kingdom, that's all about love. The kingdom itself that they're going to go into is about love. And we're going to end it with the Holy Spirit, right? So now let's end it with the Holy Spirit. When a person gets the Holy Spirit, uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So even the Holy Spirit itself makes a person produce fruits of love. So here's a recap, and then I'm going to uh, end it on uh, my Facebook. Here's the recap. Uh, I know I didn't go, I go, I went through it several times, but I'm going to go through it again. We read several accounts when people had near-death experiences. They went over into the afterlife. They went over into a, a place that they considered was the kingdom and et cetera. And each one we read, they was all engulfed in love. It was expounded upon the love that they had while they was in, in, in their livelihood on earth. They didn't want to come back because how much love they felt while they was there. The whole thing in the afterlife to them was about love. So in the, in the next realm, you can call it the Garden of Eden, you can call it the heavenly realm, you can call it the place of judgment, you can call it the place of sitting, no matter where you want to call it, when these people crossed over, the things they had in common was they all felt undescribable love. So that's the souls that cross over. Now, Swedenberg, for the kingdom himself, he said, he said his spiritual experiences, he found out that the kingdom was built off of the things you do on earth pertaining to how you love the Lord and how you love your neighbor. He said the kingdom itself is built off of love for your neighbor and love for the Lord. So we got the kingdom in the, in the, in the next realm dealing with love. We got the souls in the next realm dealing with love. God, the father of the universe, we found out that he is pure love. So we have the father being pure love and loving his creation. Then we found out that his son is pure love. And he had love for the people who's willing to do the commandments that he brought, which was love. So he loved the people to bring that brought love and to, that participated in love. And then we have the people themselves of doing the love toward their neighbors, the love towards their enemies, the love toward their household, and et cetera. And then we got the people who's filled with the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit making them give fruits of love. So hopefully we see the importance of love. This wasn't about no mosaic this, no Moses that. It was all about the love, the principle of love, and how a person interacted uh, with each other. Thank you guys for listening in. This is Elvin Israel right here from the Assembly of Sound Doctrine. Let, let me show y'all where I'm at. Uh, for my YouTube and Facebook's, Facebook audience, uh, you can also go to RPK right here. Type it in, RPK-Resurrection, Prophecy, and Kingdom. And you will see the emblem pop up. See it right there? Just click on it. Make sure you subscribe. You see uh, a plethora of videos. Uh, you see uh, 
Mr. Bobby Batch right there, uh, Mr. Daoud. You see the, the 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 plethora of information that he's bringing. So you click on the videos and you can go on, and you can see uh, all of the instructions and all of the information that we have brought. So and here's the original uh, right here, A O S D C H A N D L E R, which is my channel. Uh, thank you all for listening in, and we have more to come. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do another one tonight. This will be my second one uh, for the night so far. I don't know if I'm going to do another one or just come back tomorrow and do two more tomorrow. It depends on how the Lord got me feeling. Thank you all for listening in, and uh, shalom to you and your household. <laughs> Thank you for clicking on the channel. AOSD. Assembly of Sound Doctrine Channel. Assembly of Sound Doctrine. AOSD. RPK. Resurrection Prophet Kingdom. Like, subscribe, share. Let's go. Uh, Come get a lesson. I'm teaching blessings. No need for guessing. I'm knowledge testing. It's truth time. The wise will shine. And the wicked will pine. I'm a righteous kind. Break out of trouble, I'm keeping the subtle. Just me and my brothers and sisters. They love us, we're fixing the puzzle, no stress. And I come to the bunker, the struggle with unseen and cuz. Wanna read it, believe it, they should be back. See that, they need it, like a kid back. Breaches and pieces, like a Kit Kat, I keys and I get seized. It's a poly world, not Dolly world. Alpha love, the kingdom within. AOSD is for missing. On PK, let your journey begin. It's a poly world, not Dolly world. Alpha love, the kingdom within. AOSD is for missing. On PK, let your journey begin. A-O-S-D, 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 A-O-S-D.